Before I begin the message, I want to share with you one of the ways that I'm hoping the Spirit will direct you to respond tonight. Uh, 
And so I'd like you to look at the yellow flyer that's attached to your bulletin. My wife Tanya and I serve as directors of community life here on the mission space. And our primary goal is to multiply the number of you that are leading small groups, we're calling them life groups, in your homes or in the workplace. And so this evening, I want to invite you to consider filling out this response form. After I'm finished the message, one of the ways that you can respond is by placing this in the buckets that the ushers will bring around. And I just want to go over the boxes on the bottom that you can check before I preach this message. First, if you're interested in leading a life group, uh, this is not hard. And this week, we're going to have an orientation for any of you that have any questions about life groups or small groups on the mission space. We have three opportunities. You can see them on this flyer. T tomorrow night, March 20th at 6.30, Tuesday at 6.30, and Saturday at 9. Three different opportunities, the same orientation. You just need to come to one. And we'll share with you what our heart is for life groups and how simple it is to start. We'll give you some encouragement and even talk about a coach that we want to um, give you to help you. So I'd love for you to consider tonight checking that box. If you'd like to join a life group or would like more information on existing life groups, check that box. But again, come to the orientation. We'll be sharing about the groups and how to get in. If you're interested in finding out more about serving as a coach for life groups, uh, we have a wonderful team of folks that are investing and praying and believing and encouraging our life group leaders. If you are interested in being a part of that, check that box. If you're already leading a group and you're not connected in to community life, I guarantee you we are not going to try and control or maneuver in any way. We want the synergy and celebration that comes from all of us being on the same team. And so we'd like to know if you're doing that. There's great freedom in our life group ministry. And uh, uh, basically, we're just asking you to commit to these values, deep love, corporate intercession, biblical faith, and routine evangelism. And I'll share with you in these orientations what we mean by those values. Routine evangelism may be sharing your faith every week, or it could be praying every week for the lost that are connected with you relationally. And so uh, I'll share more about this. Again, what I'm hoping is that you will... Um, Fill out this form tonight. The ushers are going to come after the message. And I believe it's one of the ways the Holy Spirit will move through you. I want to begin the message with one of my favorite quotes. I've just recently, within the last year, found this quote. And the Lord has highlighted it in a number of ways in my life. It's a quote from Anton de Saint-Exupéry. Listen to this. He wrote... If you want to build a ship, don't summon people to buy wood, prepare tools, distribute jobs, and organize the work. Rather, teach people the yearning for the wide, boundless ocean. I'm going to read that again. If you want to build a ship... Don't summon people to buy wood, prepare tools, distribute jobs, and organize the work. Rather, teach people the yearning for the wide, boundless ocean. I want you to think about that. Pray with me. Father, I believe you have some things in your holy word that if we gave ourselves to, it would create in us a yearning for the wide, boundless church. Would you move among us tonight? In Jesus' name, amen. I want to share from my heart tonight. What I'm going to share with you tonight is really at the very core of why we said yes to serving as community life directors here on this missions base. There is within me a yearning for real church. I have a deep yearning. My father was a pastor. 
I grew up in the church. I've pastored for 20 some years. And I got to tell you this, I love the church. I've been hurt more than more deeply than any other way in my life by the church. It's not an innocent, naive love, but it is a deep love that's rooted in a yearning for what I believe is coming. The church that's coming, the message titled tonight, is the last century church. The church that's described in John 17. The church that is pictured in the Bible as a radiant bride, breathtaking in her beauty. The church of the last century, we focus a lot on the church of the first century. But the truth is, there's an awful lot in God's word about the church of the last century. And I have a deep yearning in my heart to see that radiance, that beauty. I hope it's in my lifetime. I believe that this is where we are going. And I believe that there's tremendous potential for us in this community to see this beauty. About 18 years ago, I was a part of an evangelism program with Leighton Ford. He was the chair of the Laws and Committee for World Evangelism, and I got to be in a small group of young leaders in evangelism. I was traveling as an evangelist during that season in my life, and for two years, I got to be mentored by Leighton Ford, and one of my comrades in that two-year program was in charge of a large ministry in Canada. He was a young man, but with great responsibility, and he came to me one morning, and he said, Rich, this kind of thing never happens to me. I could tell he was shaken by it. He said, last night, the Lord woke me up. And he gave me this scripture passage. And this is what the Lord said to me. He said, give this to Rich for his new church. Now, at that time, I was traveling as an evangelist. But within a year from that experience, we launched a new church in Wilmore, Kentucky, just south of Lexington. And I want you to know that for a little over a decade, it's what I lived and breathed night and day. That the Lord would give us as a church what was described in this passage. And this passage that I want to share on tonight is at the core, it's the governing scripture for community life on this missions base. It's why I said yes to this position. It's what I'm believing for. It's the yearning within me. Community life is not about summoning the workers or planning the programs or getting the right tools. Community life is about yearning for what's coming. The bride that the scripture describes as the last century church. And so I'd like you to turn to this passage with me. It's in 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. This is what we yearn for. The wide, boundless church. 1 Peter 4, verse 7, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift is received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. I want to share with you through this passage the things that I believe if we allow the Spirit to awaken in us these yearnings, 
if we allow the Spirit to awaken them in us, there is great potential for us in this ministry, in this house, in this family, to begin experiencing the church that we're dreaming for. The end of all things is near. It's a highly charged way to begin a passage. But it fits with us, doesn't it? I'm so grateful for this ministry. Since I was a young child, I believed in the soon return of Jesus Christ. I grew up with Larry Norman singing, I wish we'd all been ready. I was afraid and I knew that Jesus was coming back soon all through my ministry, but I'm telling you that in the last five years of serving in this ministry, one of the things that I'm most grateful for is a moving away from, hey, just be ready. I'm sorry to say that's the core eschatology that I was teaching for a long time. But since coming into this ministry, the Lord has helped me to settle and understand what I believe about the end of the age. I'm grateful that we teach this classical premillennialism or historical premillennialism. But more than that, I'm so grateful that we care that people understand what the Bible says about it. Because I've caught a vision of one of the great tragedies of the end of this age in Matthew 24. People who do not understand, who haven't, seen what the Bible says and wrestled to understand what's taught in Scripture, their hearts will grow cold because of offense. So I'm so glad, not only that we teach, but we care. It's what drives us, that people understand. That's why Bible study is so crucial. And I'm so thankful that we live with this urgency in this ministry. Peter, in one of his last epistles, says the end of all things is near. Now, you can disagree with our theology, but you'd be hard-pressed not to agree that the imminent return of Jesus Christ is one of the most often repeated themes in the New Testament. The imminent, soon, return of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. You remember Acts chapter 1. Jesus ascends into heaven. Can you imagine what it was like to be on that ground with Jesus as he promises power? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then not long after those last words, he begins to rise up right before their eyes. And their heads are watching them as he goes In fact, their heads are still in the clouds when they can't see him anymore. And angels appear to them and basically say, guys, you got to get your heads out of the clouds. And they're very clear. The same Jesus who you've seen go up. (laughs) Three words that would echo in them for the rest of their lives. Will come back in the same way you've seen him go. Basically, that old 70s song, for those of you that are my age. What goes up must come down. This man that you've seen ascend before your eyes will come back. It's one of the most often repeated themes in the New Testament. And let me tell you, those guys that saw him go up got it. In 2 Peter, Peter's last epistle, the third chapter, you remember these words? Verse 8, don't forget this one thing. Can you see this elder apostle as he's writing this epistle? Look, if you forget anything else, this is one thing that you can't forget. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. He's not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting any of his little ones to perish. But don't forget this one thing. The day of the Lord will come. Don't forget that. They got it. The imminent, soon return of Jesus Christ is one of the most often repeated themes in all of the New Testament. And Peter is hitting that again in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. Don't forget this. 
the end of all things is near. And he follows that with an important word, therefore. Therefore. Because of the imminent return of Jesus, because he's coming back very soon, therefore, and these are the things that we are to yearn for, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. I'll tell you, I've grown up in the church. I've pastored in the church for a long time. I've been to a whole lot of church growth conferences. And I don't think I ever saw that at the top of the list of the seven ways to have successful church. But it is the first priority for the last century church. The end of all things is near. Jesus is coming soon. Therefore, here's what we do first. And I love the intensity of the words the Spirit inspires in Peter. Be clear-minded and self-controlled. Another translation says, be sane and sober. The end of all things is near. Jesus is coming back soon. Therefore, first priority, there's an intensity in this. We must pray. Again, I am so thankful that God saw fit to call us in the middle of ministry in the church to this place so that we could learn what it means to arrange our life around prayer. This verse is telling us that it is a very wise thing to do because of the soon return of Jesus. Be clear-minded, be self-controlled. It is a very wise thing to do because Jesus is coming back to arrange your life around the priority of prayer. Maybe you have the same kind of experience that I've had as I've tried to explain to people why I'm here and what we do and why this is important. And I've come up with a lot of answers why we do what we do. One answer is because God said so. <laughs> That's a pretty blatant answer. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, the Bible says that we're to pray without ceasing because God said so. That's why we do what we do. Another reason is because prayer works. James chapter 5, verse 16 says that the prayers of righteous people are powerful and effective. <laughs> it works. Another reason is because the earth is filled with injustice. And we do this because Luke 18 tells us that God responds to people who cry out night and day with speedy justice. That's why we do what we do. Another reason is because Christ's kingdom must come. It's how Jesus taught us to pray in the model prayer that he gave to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, Howard, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's why we pray. We pray because prayer brings intimacy with Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, this is some of the best imagery in the Bible. We're told that Jesus is on a throne and we can be seated with him. That's where intercession can take you. Seated with him on the throne. But you know what? There's a better reason than all of those. Why? Because he's worthy. If he never answered another prayer, what he has done for us in Jesus Christ makes him worthy of us ordering our lives around intercession and worship until he comes again. He's worthy. He's worthy of our intercession and more. Here's why. Because right now, around God's throne, do you know what's happening? Jesus is interceding, and the angels are singing. 
And one day, the intercession and worship of heaven will converge with the intercession of worship and intercession on earth. And this whole world will be filled with the glory of God. The end of all things is near. Amen? Therefore, this is what we yearn for. This is what the church of the last century looks like. It's a church that is committed first and foremost to prayer. Serious, sane and sober, self-controlled prayer. A life given to it. The next part of this passage in verse 8 says this, above all, <laughs> above all, I want you to get the intensity of this passage. Peter is saying, look, I saw him go up. I know he's coming back down. And so these are the things that we've got to be committed to. We've got to pray. And then the next thing, above all, we've got to love each other. Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. I tell you what, it still gets me when I think about that. When I think about how much time was spent man, gathering tools and summoning workers and trying to churn up this shipbuilding process. When all along the Bible was teaching, look, if you will give yourself to prayer, and if you will love each other well, I will mark you as the community that I'm coming back for. That will make you the church of the last century. That church will be radiant. A church that prays first. And a church that above all loves each other deeply. Think about with me, when Peter, <laughs> I, I believe there was a day when Peter became a lover. When Peter stopped trying to be who he thought Jesus wanted him to be. When he came to the end of his ability. You remember that day in John 21. Peter has denied Jesus, the very thing that he swore that he wouldn't do. He was willing to throw all the other disciples under the bus. Look, Jesus, they may, but I never will. And Jesus said before the rooster crows tonight, you're going to deny me three times. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened in Peter's life. And the Bible says in Luke that Jesus came from the courtroom at just the time the rooster crowed. Right in the setting of Peter's denial. And the Bible shows us the result of this look that Luke describes. Jesus looked at him in his denial. And the Bible says that Peter ran from the courtyard weeping bitterly. And for three days he had to live in the darkness of that denial. But in John 21 he encounters Jesus again. I love that scene. I love to picture the big splash as Peter jumps out of the boat. He doesn't ask to walk on the water that time. He just dives right in and swims to the shore. And after some breakfast together, Jesus invites him to take a walk. And instead of getting an I told you so, Peter gets this question. Do you love me? Isn't that awesome? I mean, Jesus boils the whole thing down just to that question. Look, we don't have to go over anything else. This is, this is all that matters. Do you love me? And three times Peter got to counter the denials by responding, you know that I love you. I believe the third time there was an eye-to-eye -eye encounter. And Peter got to experience what it means to be fully restored by the love of Jesus Christ. 
And so as he's writing, inspired by the Holy Spirit, this epistle to the church, he's saying, look, we cannot forget that Jesus is coming back soon. The end of all things is near. So we must be clear-minded and we must be self-controlled so that we can pray. And now this is the very next thing that's important. This is what we yearn for. This is what will make us radiant above all. We've got to love in the same way that he loves. Above all, love each other deeply. And I love the description. Because love covers over a multitude of sin. Covers over. I love that imagery. Think about some imagery biblically regarding covering. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve have sinned. The radiance of innocence and glory goes out. That's all around them. The radiance of innocence and glory is now extinguished because of sin. And suddenly they see their nakedness. And the result of sin is shame. And so out of love, even after their sin, God himself covers them. Let me give you one more imagery. I love this in Genesis chapter 9. Do you remember this story? It's one of the ways we know that this is authoritative, and it's God's word, this book. Because if we wrote it, we'd take stories like this out. We would edit these. But God wrote it. And so we know that Noah, this blameless man, after the flood, he worked a vineyard, grapes, and he got drunk And then the Bible says this in Genesis chapter 9. It's kind of mysterious. The Bible says that Noah laid uncovered in his tent. I've read a lot of commentaries on this, and most of them agree that there was something that Noah did other than simply laying uncovered. Something that was an act that would bring shame. And then here's how the story goes. Noah's middle son comes into the tent and sees his father's shame and then goes out from the tent and begins to tell people about it. Two of Noah's other sons do just the opposite. The Bible says that they entered the tent going in backwards with a blanket. They refused to look at their father's disgrace and backing over him, they covered their father. That chapter goes on to describe a curse coming to that first son and blessing coming to the two boys that covered their father. I'll tell you, that's become imagery for me of what I believe the church should look like. It's not a place where we cover up sin or cover for people, but we cover them with love. A place where they know they won't be outed by gossip. A place where they feel the safety of our love for them as we cover over a multitude of sin. This covering is rooted in the term atonement, which literally is a covering by the blood of Jesus. It's rooted in how Jesus loves. And that imagery of atonement shows us how risky this kind of love is. That we offer above all to one another. Listen to this quote from C.S. Lewis. I love this. He writes, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable impenetrable, irredeemable. 
The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. Jesus is coming back soon. Therefore, we must be clear-minded and self-controlled so that we can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. Now listen to verse 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality. What do you think about when you hear the word hospitality? Most of us thinking, think about having our friends over. Hospitality means you have your friends over. Maybe you have a meal together, watch a game, play some board games. <laughs> Maybe it means having some family stay in your house for a few days. Hospitality. Some guests that you like come and you provide hospitality for them. You know what happens when you Google hospitality? You know what the first four possibilities are? Listen to this. When you Google hospitality, you get hospitality jobs, hospitality management, hospitality industry, hospitality salary. In our culture, hospitality is a business. And we'll pay for it. But that's not biblical hospitality. A friend of mine who's a professor at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky, Dr. Christine Pohl, wrote an amazing book. If you're interested in this, get ready to jot this title down, get this book. Dr. Christine Pohl's book is called Making Room, Recovering Hospitality as a Christian Tradition. Listen to what she writes. When we offer hospitality to strangers, we welcome them into a place to which we are somehow connected, a space that has meaning and value to us. This is often our home, but it also includes church, community, nation, and various other institutions. In hospitality, the stranger is welcomed into a safe, personal, and comfortable place, a place of respect and acceptance and friendship. Even if only briefly, the stranger is included in a life-giving, life-sustaining network of relations. Such welcome involves a tent of listening and mutual sharing of lives and life stories. It requires an openness of heart, a willingness to make one's life visible to others, and a generosity of time and resources. That's a good definition. Biblical hospitality is not having your friends over for a meal, and it's not an industry that you pay for. It's a lifestyle. And in the Old Testament, it comes with pretty high stakes that you not only are generous in your provision, but your hospitality also includes protection. And it's not just for people that you like, it's for strangers. In fact, the biblical word translated hospitality really is made up of words that indicate a love for a stranger like you have for your family. In fact, that's what a rabbi wrote. Listen to what a Jewish rabbi wrote. Let your home be wide open and treat poor people like members of your household. And in the Old Testament, everyone was on high alert that knew the God story. Because the people that you were being hospitable to could very well be angels. So in the New Testament, biblical hospitality, loving strangers like you love your family, not only is, hey, this would be awesome, you guys, if we would do this, it is, in the New Testament, a qualification to be a leader in the church. Hospitality. Do you hear this passage? Do you see how it runs counter to most of our church growth techniques? Jesus is coming soon. So this is what we yearn for, and this is what the church will become because Jesus is the Lord of the church, and he will see to it. 
will be clear-minded and will be self-controlled so that we pray and we arrange our lives around that priority. Above all, we love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sin. And we offer hospitality to one another. I love that Peter, through the Holy Spirit, gives us a great big heads up in this verse. Did you hear it? Offer hospitality to one another. Here it is. Without grumbling. It's a great big heads up, isn't it? This isn't meant to be fun. This isn't Thursday night with the boys. This is what you're called to. Offer hospitality, love strangers like you love your family, and do it without grumbling. You know, somebody told me something really important, I won't ever forget it. It's not scripture, but it's good. They said to me, you know, you don't have to say everything you think. That's good, isn't it? That's what Peter's saying, look, do this. Keep your mouth shut. This is not fun. This is not easy. Offer hospitality. Let people in. Listen attentively. Open up your lives. Do you see how that runs so counter to the rugged individualism of our culture? What will it take to pull us out of the tyranny of self-interest? This is what the last century church looks like. They pray. They love each other deeply, fervently. And they open up their lives. They give of themselves. We live in a culture where our home is our castle. We have a drawbridge and a moat and we fill it with hungry alligators. We live in a culture where you can practically drive through for anything. You don't even have to get out of your car and engage another person face to face. Do you know that in our culture, I've got um, some newspaper clippings in my office. Do you know what we have drive through now in this society? Drive through funeral parlors. Just stay in your car and wave your condolences. The book comes out, the little thing, you can sign it. I'll tell you what, though. It's not who we're becoming. That is not us. Jesus is the Lord of our church. He is seated on a throne far above every power and principality, and he is divinely orchestrating the events of the end of this age so that this church will be radiant. And we'll yearn for these things. It's what we're becoming. Not long ago, I read a really good read. It was entitled, a New York Times bestseller, entitled Same Kind of Different as Me. It was written by two guys. One guy was named Ron Hall, and he was an international art dealer. And the other author was a guy named Denver Moore. And he was a former enslaved cotton worker. And the book describes how they became friends. And it was rough at first because Denver was suspicious of do-gooders. And the fact is Ron wasn't really into it in the beginning. Ron's wife was a committed Christian. And so she had her husband, Ron, working with homeless people. And he wasn't his heart wasn't in it at first, but the Lord changed him through this friendship. I want to share with you about the day they became friends from the book, Same Kind of Different as Me. Denver speaking, the former enslaved cotton worker, and he says, I heard that when white folks go fishing, 
they do something called catch and release. Catch and release, I nodded sol solemnly, nervous and curious at the same time, said Ron. That really bothers me, Denver went on. I just can't figure it out. Because when colored folks go fishing, we're really proud of what we catch, and we take it and show it off to everybody that'll look. Then we eat what we catch. In other words, we use it to sustain us. So it really bothers me that white folks go to all that trouble to catch a fish, then when they done caught it, just throw it back in the water. He paused again. And the silence between us stretched a full minute. Then, did you hear what I said? I nodded, afraid to speak, afraid to offend. Denver looked away, searching the blue autumn sky then locked onto me again with that drill bit stare. So, Mr. Ron, it occurred to me, if you is fishing for a friend you're just gonna catch and release, then I ain't got no desire to be your friend. The world seemed to halt in mid-stride and fall silent around us like one of those freeze-frame scenes on TV. I could hear my heart pounding and imagine Denver could see it popping my breast pocket up and down. I returned to Denver's gaze with what I hoped was a receptive expression and hung on. Suddenly, his eyes gentled and he spoke more softly than before. But if he was looking for a real friend, then I'll be one. Forever. Jesus is coming back. So here's what the church should look like. We pray, self-controlled, sane, sober. Above all, we love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins and we offer hospitality to one another, biblical hospitality. And we don't grumble. Verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. I love that verse. There are three words in that verse that I think are highlighted when I read it. The first is gift. You know, I think, I think we're a bit off center regarding what we believe about gifts. I don't want to presume upon you, but I've spent a long time in the church, and I think we've over-individualized the gifts of the Spirit. We take inventories to find out what our gift is so that we can pigeonhole ourselves in the way that we serve Jesus, and then respond when other opportunities arise. Well, <laughs> I'd love to, but that's not my gift. You see, the ball's in the wrong court. This isn't about you. This is about the spirit who is the giver of gifts. And let me say something that seems rather clear. The Holy Spirit's really good at all the gifts. And he's in you. And we've individualized this so that we can continue to function in the things that are probably our natural inclinations instead of maturing in Christ so that the spirit that is in us can function in any way he desires for the good of Christ's kingdom at that time. That's what happens in maturity with Christ. The spirit that's in you is good in all the gifts. And he's given you these gifts for the second highlighted word in this verse to me, so that you can serve. A survey was done, this was probably a decade ago, but I remember reading it, I think in Leadership Magazine, all kinds of people were asked this question, why does the church exist? 89% of the responses came in this form to meet my needs. 89%. Why does the church exist? 
to meet my needs. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out why megachurches are megachurches. Whoever does that best has the most people. But that's not why the church exists. The church exists to glorify Jesus Christ. And it exists so that every one of us can serve him. That's what this verse is saying. Each of you should use whatever gift is received to serve others. And what do we serve? Great big heaping helpings of grace. Faithfully administering grace. This is what we get to do. This is what we are becoming. This is the last century church, the breathtaking church, the radiant church. And I believe God has postured us to begin seeing this with increasing measure here in Kansas City. Jesus is coming back so that we pray seriously and love deeply. We offer hospitality and we keep our mouths shut. And we serve up grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. I want to close this message with a story. It's one of my favorite stories. It involves a friend of mine named Morris. He's a leader in the church in Myanmar. I love him with all of my heart. I spend a good bit of my time trying to figure out how to raise more and more and more finances for the work that he's doing. He's got a church that he planted in Yangon and a seminary that has two campuses. By the way, this seminary that Morris planted, I've known Morris for about 12 years. Not long ago, blessed our own Daniel and Levi Lim with a Doctor of Divinity degree. I got to go and receive it on their behalf. I met Morris when he was at Asbury Theological Seminary. He came to me applying for the job to clean our church. Seemed like a great guy, was very interested and very needy. And so we talked for a while, I got to know him, and then we hired him. Not long after that, I walked into our church, which was an old holiness camp meeting, big old metal building tabernacle with garage doors all the way around, cement floor. Morris was cleaning that tabernacle on Sunday morning before the people came. And I went in there and I saw him cleaning with one hand and with the other hand, it was raised up in intercession, praying in tongues for the people that would come. And I thought, we're not paying him enough. Morris was in Wilmore alone. In fact, he had been educated in America, four years of college, three years of seminary. He was at Asbury for a doctoral degree because his calling was to establish a seminary. And he had been alone throughout all that education in America, not because he wanted to. He had a wife and two precious daughters. But for seven years, he lived apart from them because our embassy wouldn't let them come into this nation. And so Morris was alone. The first year that I knew Morris, and he was in our church family, my mother in early December proudly announced that she had just invited Morris to spend Christmas with us. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I did not react well to that. Christmas is a big deal to me and to our family. And it's pretty hectic. And, you know, there are, you know, a dozen adults and a dozen kids when we all get together in a small house. And I was just not at all sure that Morris would want to come to our house. You see, I had just heard that week that Morris was looking for a pig's head to cook. They don't eat what we eat in Myanmar. I've got stories. I've been there six times now. I've got awesome stories I can share with you at another time. I was pretty sure Mars wouldn't even like our turkey and sweet potatoes and cream corn. And the truth is, 
I like just having my family. Morris was in my church. I wouldn't feel as free on Christmas. I'd have to kind of be a pastor. And I was kind of ticked. But you don't argue with my mother. Morris was coming on Christmas. He showed up Christmas Day at my parents' house. Our whole family was there, and he had several bags of gifts. Now, I knew Morris's financial condition. And so I was surprised to see him come in with gifts. He put them in my father's office. And the first thing that he did when he came into our house that Christmas day, he took out a little notepad and a pencil and he went around to all the children in our family. We've got a bunch of them between my sisters and our family. And he wrote down the names of every one of our kids, what their age was. And he got down on his haunches and looked at them in the eye and told them that he was going to pray for them all year long. He sat at our table and ate our food. Look, they don't eat what we eat. But he was so gracious. English was still a bit of a challenge and he listened hard and tried to laugh at just the right times. (laughs) He was so alert to us. And then after the meal, when we were gathered around the family room, he went in and got the bags. And he pulled out little tin globes. There were banks. And he gave one to each of the children. And he showed them where Myanmar was. He said, this is where I live. And then for each of the adults, he had beautiful laminated maps of his nation. And he took time to show us where God was going to start the seminary that is thriving right now. And then, at the bottom of the bag was the best gift. And he went to my mother and pulled out a beautiful afghan. And he placed it on my mother's lap. And then he told us this story. He said, last Christmas, I was walking the streets of the town that I lived in alone. And my heart was just broken that I wasn't with my family. He thought about the people that would gather Christmas Eve and sing Christmas carols all night long until Christmas morning. And he thought about his wife and his daughters and he just began weeping. He called his wife that Christmas a year before. And they cried together and prayed together. And then he said this, Christmas last year, my wife began making this afghan. And with every stitch, she prayed that someone would have her husband in their home the following year. All right, we were all crying. I was feeling really bad. (laughs) I started to understand what Hebrews 13 verse 2 says about opening up your lives because sometimes you entertain angels and you're not even aware. All right. This is an awesome community. There's no doubt about it. There are things about us that I treasure. And I'm so thankful that God's called us here. But we could grow more in this. It's who we're becoming. It's what makes the last century church radiant. Look, in community life, 
we are not trying to figure out what tools we need. And we're not trying to figure out how we can churn up more enthusiasm and summon more people. But we are saying this, Jesus, have mercy on us. And would you, would you baptize us in such a way that this becomes the mark that's on us with increasing measure? Just this week, somebody emailed me a word that she says was spoken over the fellowship in this building in the mid-80s. I can't confirm that, but I would love to think that it's a word that God is speaking over us today. She said 27 years ago, in June of 1983, this was a word. God is going to give your fellowship a baptism of love. You will be spittering and sputtering before he lets you up. But when he does, you will be called a love movement, a people known for passion for Jesus and love of the brethren. That's who we're becoming. Amen? I want you to stand with me. I'd like for the worship team to come. And I'd like you to get that yellow flyer out. Look, you don't have to sign anything in blood. Really, all I'm asking you to do is come to one of those orientations. And I'd like to know if you're coming. So I'd like you to fill it out. The ushers, you know what? If the ushers would just stand here in the front around the perimeter with buckets, one of the ways I'd like you to respond is by filling out that yellow flyer and bringing it to one of the ushers. But I'll tell you, I am so convinced of this. It's why the first thing that I asked for when I took this position as community life director was the 6 a.m. Sunday morning set because this will not be born in us. This baptism of love will not happen because we've figured out some great programs. It will happen because the Spirit descends on us. And I need, I believe some of you need to respond to the Holy Spirit tonight and stand here in the front of the sanctuary and pray with us for a baptism of love on this mission space. And I'd love for you to respond to tonight's message. And I'd like you to leave from this place alert, to those you can open your life to. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we welcome your spirit to move in this sanctuary and help us, Jesus, to respond. Lord, for some, it's a simple act of saying, I'll go and find out more at these orientations. For others, it's very specific Jesus is saying, open your lives. Put down the drawbridge. Offer hospitality. And serve grace. So I pray. I pray for an increase in these values. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come? Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, and I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. 
give you my soul And I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm away Lord, have your way in me for the lonely in our spiritual family. I pray for the disconnected. I pray for the fringe. But I pray even more for those of us that are consumed with lesser things than these primary values in the last century church. calling for a baptism of love on us as a spiritual family. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, let us be spittering and sputtering until you let us up. Do a work in us that brings about an even greater radiance. Lord, I'm so grateful for the intense times of intimacy in the global prayer room. And I'm so thankful for the way your spirit moves in awakening. For the way your word is proclaimed in forerunner Christian fellowship. But I pray, Lord, that there would be more happening around our kitchen tables during the week. I pray that our family rooms would be opened up. I pray for our lives to embrace i
physical healing. Then just come and stand on these lines at the front. We want to pray for you. I ask the Lord to release His power. Just keep your hand raised. You want prayer for physical healing. Just come stand on the lines at the front. I want to invite about a hundred of you to come to lay hands on these ones right now. Just ask them what they need prayer for. Ask them what they're asking the Lord to do for them tonight. If you need prayer for any other breakthrough as well, you're welcome to come and stand on these lines. 10 o'clock, we'll transition into a time of devotional time of waiting on the Lord and just the prayer room will continue. But the last 40 minutes, we want to ask the Lord to release His healing power, to release miracles. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would anoint our hands as we lay our hands on the sick. I ask that you would release your healing power in this room tonight. Again, if you love the Lord, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, just come and welcome to join, be part of the ministry team. The qualification, Jesus said, is if you believe in my name, you'll lay your hands on the sick and they'll recover. Just stand in front of them. I encourage you to stand in front of them and ask them, what am I praying for? Begin to dialogue with them, pray for them, and then say, ask them what they're feeling as you're praying for them. Talk to the Lord and then talk to the person you're praying for. Have them move their body around. Test out what you're praying for. Felt like the Lord is going to touch some. Just No one's praying for you until they're praying for you. Just put your hand on the part of your body that's in pain. Felt like the Lord says He wants to touch hips tonight. Hip conditions. I saw somebody, uh, 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 an older lady, you need to, uh, to use a stick. Maybe not all the time, but you need to use a stick. And it may be your left hip. Left hip condition, but there's like arthritic pain all around your hips and your pelvic area. That's you just... Lord wants to touch you tonight. I also saw someone with a, the phrase was uh, sickle, sickle stem, blood condition, sickle stem, blood condition, blood condition. If that's you, just even if you're watching online, just put your hands before the Lord. Someone problems with their arteries. The phrase they got was angioplasty, but you have kind of clogged arteries in your heart area. If that's you, you have a heart condition. I want you to raise your hand. The Lord wants to touch your heart tonight. Also, if you have hearing problems, hearing conditions, the Lord's going to heal someone of deafness tonight, partial hearing loss. If that's you, just raise your hand. Just Come up to the front, in fact, if that's you. Anyone with hearing conditions, I want you to come stand right at the front here. I want to pray for you. Holy Spirit, we love your presence. We love the way you love us. You delight to heal our bodies. Also, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Anyone in the room with carpal tunnel, the Lord wants to touch wrists carpal tunnel issues Holy Spirit we invite you to come we break the power of sickness we take authority over sickness in Jesus name Holy Spirit release the power of the blood of Jesus on bodies all over this room right now if you still need someone to pray for you just raise your hand he can touch you even when no one's praying for you but I want to encourage invite anyone who's able to come and help us pray right now. Lord, release your power in this room. Release your power in this room. Touch heart conditions. Lord, we speak to the arteries. We command that whatever is in those arteries, that plaque in the arteries, that those arteries would become clear, the blood would flow. That sickle cell, anemia, that condition. We just speak healing. We curse that disease in Jesus' name. 
We speak to ears and command them to open. We speak to arthritis and we curse that spirit of infirmity in the hips in Jesus' name. Every sickness and every disease in this room. Holy Spirit, release your fire. Release your fire. Achilles tendon injury. If you have an Achilles tendon injury, your left foot. Right now we speak healing to that Achilles tendon. We speak your healing power to that Achilles tendon in Jesus' name. We speak to cancers and tumors. Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, do what you love to do. Release your power on bodies right now. We command ears to open. We command ears to open. Inner ear conditions, perforated eardrums, be healed in Jesus' name.
we're going to continue to worship. But if you, I want to encourage you right now, if you have a condition that you can test out, just begin to test it out right now. If it's an ankle or a knee or a back or an arm or a lump that you can test out or breathing condition or a hearing condition, <clears throat> just test it out. Just test it out. Do something you couldn't do before. Try something you couldn't do five minutes ago. There might be no difference. There might be 100% difference. But actually move it about. Move your body about. Some things you won't be able to know until 10, until an hour's time, a day's time, a week's time. But I encourage you, when, when you know that you're 80% or more healed, I urge you to testify of it. Not so that you can come on the platform, but testify of it because God is glorified when we give testimony of what He's done. When we make it public, when we make it known what He's done, the Lord Jesus is glorified. Even if you're watching online, I encourage you to email us. Let us know what the Lord is doing. We have a testimony team over here. If you know you've been healed, if you know you're 80% or more improved, just come and fill out one of the forms here with our team. We're going to continue in worship right now. But again, if I encourage you, it's biblical. Jesus told those, see, some he told, don't tell anyone, but he said, go show yourself to the priests. Some he said, go tell all your friends and family what the Lord has done. But we know from Revelation chapter 12, that one of the ways we overcome, one of the ways we stand in our healing is when we testify of what the Lord has done. We overcome, we walk, part of walking out our healing is to testify. The word of our testimony is one powerful way in which we confirm ourselves in our healing.
I love your presence I love I love I love your
Yes, He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. Oh, how He loves us. We are His portion. He is our prize, drawn to redemption by the grace in His eyes. And if grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. Now heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss in my heart turns violently inside my chest i don't have time to maintain these regrets when i think about the way that he loves us oh how he loves us oh he loves us, oh, how He loves See 